Ian Ross, I'm glad we could spend some time talking about your collaboration with Emma Rice on Wuthering Heights, which is not the first project that I think of as being necessarily one that has a lot of music in it, but we'll discuss the history of that a little bit later in our conversation. But I do want to start asking you about as head of music for, for Wise Children, you have a front row seat to seeing how Emma works, and you've collaborated her, with her for quite some time. What makes her approach to theater not just something unique for audiences, but something unique for you as a, as a composer? Um, well, I guess to to frame that a bit, I've been working with Emma for years previously in the with the company Nehi Nehi Theatre in Cornwall, and I think a lot of her process is was sort of formed by that. Um, and. I haven't worked much outside of Nehi or with Emma uh, to have much of a comparison, but I think from what I gather from other people's sort of um, uh, experiences is that there's there's a freedom in the room. There's a generosity. Emma, Emma creates a space of um, anything's possible where mistakes are welcomed, um, in fact, encouraged and um generosity is sort of at the heart of the whole process um and as a creative in that it's there's so much space sometimes it's you feel a little overwhelmed with the amount of choices that that you you can have but that you can you can find yourself within that space um yeah it's it's brilliant it's a it's a very sort of free um, free not to say that it's undisciplined because it's not it's quite the opposite but it's it, it certainly allows a lot of space to find your own story within the story well it's interesting because I was listening to sound clash that the two of you had recorded and it became very clear in listening to that that there is this generosity of spirit that the two of you share and that you seem to have you know a pretty open collaboration where you can bring you know, whatever you want to the equation and she brings what she wants. And somehow it seems like you guys end up on the same page rather effortlessly. Is that an accurate description? I, I think so. I think we do share similar tastes and sim similar sort of um, emotional approaches to things. Um, but that's not to say that we don't have times where our ideas are clashing too, you know, that that's sort of part of the course. She always says that, um, a, a bad idea looks after itself and um and i always think of the you know the when they tie off a sheep's tail and then eventually it just dies and drops off it's a bit like that you sort of you you, you have to give give space to bad ideas as well um in order for them to find their own way you know and to and, and if they're not right then it, it's sort of the process edits them in the long run i think well, and I also think artists have to have room to fail as well, don't they? Absolutely. It's the, it's fundamental, I think, to, to to making good art. Right. Now, I haven't seen every Nehi show and every, every uh, Wise Children show, but I've seen a lot of them. And this strikes me sight unseen as the first to use original songs in a significant way in any of the shows that Emma has done. as And using it so significantly as part of the narrative. How and why did the two of you feel like this was the show for that approach to be explored? Well, I think, first of all, the writing that Emma did when she first decided to do Wuthering Heights, she she went and stayed up on the moors in Yorkshire, in, in the area where Wuthering Heights was written and, and set. Um, and she wrote a lot of poetry. She read, she read the book, but she also just wrote... Um, lots of of sort of broad poetic ideas for things and when we first did the research and development um they were supposed to be just just uh to be said to be spoken but i have i try to put everything to music if i can i'm always trying to turn something into a song um just because it's it's a joy it's it's the best feeling to have a page of lyrics and and a blank canvas like that um so it just felt like the the poetry thing for her, I think, was relatively new, that she was bringing her own writing into things a bit more, you know, rather than just adapting things um, and becoming more confident as a, as a lyricist, but not quite knowing it, I think. Um, 
so yeah it just i i really pushed for for turning some of that poetry into song um and that just led to the feeling that that maybe our sort of combination lyricist and, and composer in that in in that way was was a healthy one you know well it's interesting because the show runs from what i can see two hours and 50 minutes the cast album that's released runs 23 minutes so yes. how important was it for you, the two of you to figure out not just when music can be used, but when you absolutely do not? Um, well, quite important, really. But I think also in, in mind of Emma's in, in mind of Emma's um, approach to to allowing all ideas until they find their you know, they're, they're no good. Um, there's never a wrong time for for music. There's never a wrong time for a song, as far as as far as I think, because I feel like it's such a direct way of telling a story, and you can condense, especially with something like Weather in Heights, which has got so much information. You can condense quite a lot of of sort of narrative uh, narrative forwarding through plunking a little song there, um, and yeah, I guess. I don't think we really came upon a moment where we thought this was definitely not working. Uh, we always just tried, and most of the time it felt like it was it was serving a purpose. Right. Well, I guess a lot of uh, people who who um, create original musicals say this is the point where words won't work any longer, and they have to express themselves in song. Was that a similar thought process here? Yeah, I'd say so. And and it, and and because of, because of the nature of it being. Um, uh, poetic rather than uh, descriptive, if, if you like, but then it can, it can tell an even broader story. It wasn't this happened and then and then this is how I'm feeling about it. It was this this big sort of cosmic approach, you know, to the moors, to the feelings of Heathcliff, to um, the the complexity of the love between between Kathleen and, and Heathcliff. We could tell that story, you know, broadly, but with lyrics and with with uh, song. And I have to say, I find it very interesting that that Emma chose to write poetry when Emily Bronte was known for her poetry. Right. I mean, it's a pretty bold move, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Um, um, yeah. But I think what was what was great about that was because we used one of Emily uh, Bronte's poems and set to music, the Bluebell. Um, so she was she was keen to to get that in there as well, you know, as a as a, a nod. Um, but I think what what was cool about Emma's approach was she was she was bringing in this um, this idea of the the bigger forces, the, the godly forces of the Moors and of the love affair and of um, the, the the afterlife. Um, and I think it just brought an entirely different flavor. It was sort of incomparable, really, to to the work of Emily Bronte. But did Emily Bronte's novel inspire you on any level, or were you working strictly off of what Emma had had decided to do? Yes, I I I, I read it. I only read it once, and um, uh, in parts of it, found it hard going. I think some of the 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 language and the and the dialect stuff is um, almost impenetrable. Um, but I think what's really inspiring about it is the is the setting and the feeling of the moor. And also because we went and stayed up there as well for, for a few days, having that, um, visiting the area where the Brontes were, understanding more about the history of the of the um, area and their family sort of connection to it. I think that was more um, inspiring for me than the novel itself. Um, yeah. How do you as an artist take the environment in which something is set as inspiration for the work that you do? Um, good question. I think I think I like to I like to start and what the conversations I have with Emma actually in the early stages of things, we always start really broadly. So there's the things connected to the to the story but what's really informative for me is is going going into that place and feeling the dampness feeling the 
the weather was just such a thing the way that things that clouds can come over very quickly and then pass and everything's illuminated and then a storm rolls in and then it's snowing um and it's so turbulent and so reflective isn't it of the, of the relationships in the novel and i think uh, immediately I, I feel that there's an epicness to the story and to the setting which um is a, is appealing for the stage but also as a composer because you can just do big grand um sort of gestural work um and pick the right moments for it and then just bring it back so really it was the dynamic it was like the dynamic of those those juxtapositions um that that i used because i haven't seen weathering heights yet um and I've only listened to the cast album, it strikes me that a lot of the music seems to be almost like a Greek chorus um, mm -hmm. backing up the main drama. And I'm wondering how how and why you chose that approach, if I'm not mistaken, you know, in how the music plays a role in the story. In well, in terms of the, the, the vocal um, side of things, Emmett often uses a chorus um, in, in her work. And uh, in this one, she's used the more as the character, as the chorus character. And I love to write for voices. Um, I think it's just the, the, the best um, spectacle for stage, really, is, is as many people as possible singing at once. Um, it, it, it's, it's just very powerful. Um, and what was the question? Sorry, I got lost. Well, the idea of a Greek chorus, you know, you're using the the Moors as sort of the, I, I don't know if they are, if, if the Moors, the landscape is a Greek chorus, but it does seem from what I'm listening to that it's not necessarily Heathcliff has a song and Kathy has a song and, you know, the other characters have a song. It seems more like they are surrounded by people who are helping us navigate our way through the story. Absolutely true. Yeah. Um, it, it, it It's, I think it's a hallmark of Emma's work. Um that that just works to bring to bring everybody into the production audience included and i assume you have to do that on a scale that makes it affordable to tour that makes it affordable to produce absolutely yeah so it's never quite the 200 piece choir that i'd like but 13 13 strong is okay would you like to see a 200 piece choir for this oh yes absolutely there are moments when um when the more could just expand into the cosmos and um yeah 200 voices would be magnificent yeah and well, an orchestra big, why not i was gonna say how big an orchestra would you need to accompany 200 voices oh i don't know 65 65 piece yeah i'd like to hear that yeah that'd be great <laughs> class differences are an important part of this of this story did that influence the way you approach the music definitely um I I I feel like that's the, the the folk the folk element of the story is constantly at, at play against the uh, sort of the civilized society, and I try I really wanted to feel a sense of the um, like the baroque in the music. But I, I, but also the sensibility of English folk, some really simple, um, sort of plain harmony, um, work, and coincidentally, the 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 guy who who was living next door to me throughout lockdown was the was the uh, guitarist who's now doing the tour, and he's one of the one of the Bristol's sort of well known folk artists, a guy called Sid Goldsmith, and he's a he's a folk so sing folk singer and song collector and um fantastic um um concertina player and guitarist um and it just felt it just felt really um a great opportunity to bring that that voice into the piece that true authentic sort of folk sound and then try and set it set it against two things really the 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 the, the wild cosmos um, and the refined um, brush cross grange uh, side of it as well. What's interesting is you're talking about Baroque and, you know, folk music. I have to say, listening to Kathy's Curse, I was imagining Patti Smith sing that song. 
yeah <laughs> yeah that sort of comes out of nowhere uh, hopefully when you get to see the show you'll see that that's um yeah that that that's a sort of a peak that takes a while to get there but it it, it pops out for for good narrative reason i think so are there uh, i i don't know whether patty smith was an inspiration but you know there are other artists you know pop artists particularly kate bush who famously recorded a song about this story and i'm wondering beyond the other references you've talked about are there contemporary influences that find their way into what you've done for Wuthering Heights? Um, absolutely. I, I'm, I think, I think I always try and I'm, I'm always influenced by my own uh, sort of musical journey. And here in Bristol, there's um, a tradition of, of, of bass music of um, dub reggae and trip hop and, and, ska reggae um and so i always i always feel like i I want to bring a bit of that into it because it's also a, a piece of me um but in terms of that tune in terms of the the rocking out really the influence was uh, L- uh lucy mccormack who was playing kathy when we devised the the show and she's uh she's just an outstanding vocalist and performer in her own right theater maker um and we were just talking about this moment being it wanted to feel like um you were in a garage when you were 14 and you were you've been playing a guitar for a few a few months and you were just starting to make a noise with your friends and um and it was that yeah that sort of discovery of of um being able to being able to um express a very particular feeling through making a big raggedy noise with guitars and drums you know it's it's that um so yeah nobody specific apart from lucy i'd say lucy was a big influence though. right now in the in the sound clash interview that you did with emma you said as you get older you realize you can do more with less mm. how did did that realization come to you before after or during the process of creating weathering heights um actually i think I think the realization came a lot a lot longer before that and right at the beginning of of working with Emma of of she we she, she won awards actually for her version of the red shoes which they made a long time with knee high and and I had the good fortune to tour on it's on one of its revivals um and they never had a live band in it but then when they brought it back one time they did and there was a bit at the beginning where it's uh, Hans, Hans Christian Andersen, you know, and the first line was, I think, there once was a girl. Um, and through the first few lines of the play, when you're just simply in, in that sort of folk, folk story way, laying out the first lines once upon a time, she just had um, a harp, a couple of notes on the harp, so it would go, once there was a girl, dum, 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 that, um, something else. Dum, dum, dum. and it was all punctuated with just with single lines you know um and I, I really at that moment I was like oh this is this is where it's at you can you can as long as you're careful with your choices you can you can do the simplest thing and tell the the, the broadest story how do you walk that line between being simple and being minimalist Oof um i think with experience i think it's um yeah i carefully you walk them carefully that's what i'll say (laughs) um now at at the top at the top of this conversation i mentioned that this is not the first time somebody has has applied music to wuthering heights cliff richard wrote a musical version of wuthering heights bernard j Yeah. yeah i can't imagine um, Bernard J. Taylor did one. Paul Dick are three people who created musicals out of, out of this novel. And then yeah. a composer, Bernard Herman, best known for his, his film scores with Alfred Hitchcock, wrote his only opera based on Wuthering Heights. Um, and right? it, it did not have its first performance until 1982. Why do you think this novel, written so long ago, serves as such catnip? for creators to not just turn them into plays, but turn them into musicals or turn them into operas, or in this case, a sort of hybrid show. 
Yeah. I don't know. I guess there's something there's something enduringly fascinating about the the sort of the central love story, you know, Kathy and Heathcliff, which is really not the largest part of the novel, right? But um, there there's is a, a really it's an upsetting love. Although there's passion, there's hatred, and and there's this fascinating sort sort of um, tension between those things, where we're not even sure that we want them to be together at all. <laughs> um, but it, but it's so rich, isn't it, to to try and to try and put that into song and put that on, on stage or on film. Um, I think maybe it's that. I think it's the complexity of their of their love. Well, I also think complex love stories are the ones that we respond to most, at least in, in dramatic form. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, you know, all the way up to Titanic, you know, it seems like stories where the couple doesn't end up together or there is death or separation or whatever are the ones that we respond to the most. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we as, as a people so strongly respond to stories where couples don't end up together? Gosh, I don't know. I, the, the thing that pops into my med, my head immediately was the World Cup. And so it feels a little bit like football and, and the English fascination with, you know, football, because we barely ever win these big international things. But it's that similar feeling of really like getting behind something um, and ultimately ending up in, in disappointment, but then coming back again and again for, for the same disappointment. Um, I don't know. Perhaps we get off on it. Well, I, I hate to say this, but I was rooting for Argentina through the whole the whole World Cup, mostly because I wanted Messi to finally have a World Cup on his oh, mantle. Yeah. Oh, get on! That was so good, wasn't it? Well, my wife is Colombian, so the household was was pretty South South America uh, centric. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because England did disappoint yet again. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Um, well, I just want to ask you one more thing, Ian. You know, Emily Bronte only wrote one novel and it was this one and she died a year after it was published and she was only 30 years old if somehow she could flash forward into the future and sit down in the audience and watch this show what do you think she would have to say about what you and emma have done with it wow gosh it's different isn't it what what i think she'd think and what she actually might think but um I think it's a real I think we 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 love it and I think that's clear. I think we care a lot about it and I think we've poured a great deal of ourselves into it which I think she did too, right? And I think that the the, the life that she led and the things she endured in order to be able to 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 be this historic figure um I think we've I think we've paid tribute to it. And I think she'd enjoy it. And I think she'd probably be pretty baffled by a bunch of it too. Um, and maybe a little shocked <laughs> at some of the language and, and and some of the things. But yeah, I think overall she'd she'd give it a thumbs up. Well, I, I certainly hope so. And I very much look forward to seeing Wuthering Heights uh, when it finally makes its way to Beverly Hills. Um, so thank you for your time. Are you all right with my posting this interview on our YouTube channel? Of course, yes. Please share. Terrific. I will do. Thank you so much, Ian, and, and have a good evening. Thank you. Nice to meet you. All right. You. Likewise. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.